Professor Ishani Rodrigo is a senior lecturer in pediatrics at the Kotalavala Defense University and a consultant in pediatrics. She is also the head of the clinical department of Kotalavala Defense University. Dr. Nishant Kumar Singha is presently attached to the anatomy department of the Faculty of Medicine, Kotalavala Defense University as a senior lecturer. This session will be judged by Professor Aloka Patirana, Dean, Professor? Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri uh, Jawadhanapura, uh, 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 okay. and Professor Anama Vijay Singha, Dean, <laughs> Faculty of Medicine, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. We are honored to have two eminent academics of Sri Lanka to judge this session. I cordially invite <laughs> Professor Ishani Rodrigo and Dr. Nishanta Kumara Singha to commence this session. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry that we had a few issues with the connections, but I hope all of you can hear. Just a few announcements before we start. Please mute your microphones because that um, uh, it improves the quality of the session because audios I otherwise get disturbed. Um, uh, uh, for the presenters, each presentation is um, uh, each presentation is ten minutes, and there is four minutes for discussion. We have four, six presentations, oral presentations for this session. So, um, uh, uh, at the at the end of if you, if you have any questions, you can type the questions in the chat box show, shown on your screen. And also, um, if you need to ask a question, please raise your hand. And at the end of the presentation, I will um, uh, announce these questions so that the presenter can answer. Okay, so with that, let's get to the first presentation. The title of the presentation is Demography and Disease-Related Factors Affecting Pluriters Among Patients with Chronic plaque, uh, dermatology unit, uh, chronic plaques, psoriasis, um, presenting to the dermatology unit in Sri Lanka, a pilot study. The paper is by PLA in Lienage, PLGC Lienage, PV De Silva, J. Akaravita, C. Gunasekara, S. Imafuku, and S. Le Kambasam. The paper will be presented by PLA in Lienage. Good day to all of you. I'm Dr. Achala Lienage. The topic of my research is demographic and disease related factors affecting pruriders among patients with chronic plaque psoriasis attending dermatology unit of a tertiary care center in Sri Lanka, which was a pilot study. Psoriasis is a common chronic inflammatory skin disease and is found in about one to 3% of the general population. Although it is not considered as a pruritic dermatosis, pruritus can be the most bothersome symptom experienced by the patients with psoriasis. Further, pruritus adds to cogna phenomenon, causing worsening and chronifying the skin lesions. And it also causes psychological distress, poor quality of life in patients with plaque psoriasis. On the other hand, anti-psoriatic medication could also have an impact on pruritus where it alleviates with systemic and topical anti-inflammatory agents, while it can even worsen by the use of commonly used irritant topical treatment used to treat psoriasis. Therefore, the objective of the study was to evaluate the prevalence, severity of pruritus, and the disease-related factors associated with pruritus among patients with plaque psoriasis. 
This was conducted as a cross-sectional study. 199 consecutive patients were recruited from dermatology clinics at National Hospital Sri Lanka, Colombo. Those who were aged 18 years or more were included into the study. The demographic and disease-related data were collected using an interviewer-administered questionnaire. The psoriasis severity was assessed using psoriasis area severity index score, and the severity of pruritus was determined uh, by using 10-point visual analog scale. And we found in the study sample, the median age was 54 years with an interquartile range from 42 to 62. There was slight male preponderance with 56.3%. And considering the severity of psoriasis according to the psoriasis area severity index, 52.2% had milder disease, 30.6% had moderate severe disease, and the severe disease was observed in 18.6% 18 of patients. The median dermatology life quality index was seven. And the presence of pruritus for the last six weeks was experienced by 78.9%. The median pruritus severity was three. Now out of 199 patients, 157 patients had experienced pruritus. When we compare when we consider the two groups of patients with pruritus and those without pruritus, the mean age, gender, smoking status, and the disease duration showed no significant statistical difference. However, the patients with pruritus compared to those without pruritus had severe disease according to the uh, psoriasis area severity index score. With regards to anti-psoriatic treatment of the two groups, it showed similar distribution. Now, among the 157 patients who experienced pruritus, they were again classified considering the severity of pruritus. And one group was classified as less than five of score, as less intensity group, and more than or equal five of score as high intensity group. And when we compare the two groups, those who had higher intensity of each was mostly women and had higher body surface area involvement with psoriasis. But there was no difference with regard to the age, smoking status, disease duration, and also with regard to the treatment modality. So in conclusion, pruritus is prevalent among patients with chronic plaque psoriasis, especially among those with severe disease. And the age, the duration of the disease are not associated with pruritus. These are my... Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sean? The paper the paper is uh, open for discussion. Please ask your questions. Yeah, I like to ask a question: Is uh, smoking a recognized risk factor for pruritus in uh, psoriasis? And is the apparent lack of significance in your study due to the number of smokers in the entire study being very small? Two questions there. 
I'm Dr. Achala here, sir. It is not a recognized uh, uh, factor for pruritus, but apparently the pruritus can cause increased severity of uh, psoriasis. So indirectly, it can cause an uh, increase in uh, severity of pruritus, in, in presence of pruritus. So it is not a recognized uh, factor for pruritus itself, smoking status. Thank you. Angela, may I ask you a question? Um, did you look at the outside temperature in relation to pruritus? Because um, an observation we make sometimes, especially in children, is that when they get too warm, the pruritus increases. So did, were you able to look at uh, the, uh, the environmental temperature? No, madam, it is, it was beyond the scope of the research. Actually, if we, we, if we can uh, uh, incorporate the, the, the physiology of the, uh, the, the, the temperature, the tra transepidermal water loss and other parameters into this uh, study, uh, this would uh, have uh, more impact on the, 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 the physio dermal, dermal, dermal physiology. Uh, I could have answered this question, but uh, this uh, the, your 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 question is beyond my uh, scope of the research. Okay, thank you. Uh, Any can other I ask questions? Yeah, one, one so, question, yes, please. Madam, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, you used a cutoff of five for uh, the severity of two writers, isn't it? Yes. Is that a validated cutoff, or did you choose it yourself? That, that was used myself, sir, my madam, and uh, it, it, in, 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 in other studies also, the severity was uh, uh, based on uh, if it is uh, cut off, it, 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 if it is classified into two groups, it was the, 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 the cutoff margin was taken as five. But there are studies that they have uh, classified into three groups, mild, moderate and severe. In those settings, it was classified less than three as mild and three to seven as uh, moderate severe and more than seven as severe disease. However, mm -hmm. because of my uh, limited sample, I had to cut off, uh, I had to uh, classify it into two groups. You didn't use a median cutoff or something like that? The statistical no. no, no, madam, no. It's five. Oh, okay. Yes, it would be good to have a basis for a cutoff. It will strengthen your research. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so, so thank you, Dr. Lienege, for that excellent presentation and also to keeping in time. So, um, Let's uh, 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 we come to the end of the first presentation. So let's move on to the second presentation. Thank you very much. The second presentation for today is prescription state of statins in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, are we following the guidelines? This paper is, uh, uh, paper is from A.T. Mathias, PhD Kaushalya, G. Somatilaka, and C. Garusimha. The paper will be presented by P.D.J. Kaushalya. Please go ahead. I'm Germany Kaushalya, a pre intern representing Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jawadhanpura. The research that we are presenting today is prescription of statins in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Are we following the guidelines? So, this is the outline of the presentation. So, when we consider about the motivation to conduct this research, when we consider about the leading causes of the deaths globally, cardiovascular diseases accounts for around one third of the deaths globally. And when we consider about the proportional mortality in Sri Lanka, cardiovascular diseases accounts for around 34%. 
and 83% of deaths in Sri Lanka are caused by non-communicable diseases. One out of five Sri Lankans has either diabetes or pre-diabetes. So what is the leading cause of death among individuals with diabetes? It is cardiovascular diseases, mainly myocardial infarction. So studies are beneficially reduction of morbidity and mortality associated with the cardiovascular diseases. And each one millimole per liter reduction of LDLC levels is associated with reduction of mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events by 0 0.80 consistently in both primary and secondary prevention. According to the American Heart Association guidelines on the primary prevention of the cardiovascular diseases, it recommends the use of moderate intensity statin in type 2 diabetes mellitus who are aged between 40 to 75 years. So moving on to the objective of, objectives of our study, our general objective was to audit the number of statin-eligible diabetes patients who are prescribed with statin therapy. And our specific objective was to determine the factors associated with prescribing statin to type 2 diabetes patients. So next, moving on to the methodology, this was conducted as a cross-section study without any interventions and conducted at the University Medical Clinic and the Endocrinology Clinic at the Columbus South Teaching Hospital from February to April 2021. And patients with type 2 diabetes attending University, of Medical, University Medical Clinic and Endocrinology Clinic at the Columbus South Teaching Hospital were recruited, aged between 40 to 75 years. And we excluded type 1 diabetes patients, pregnant women, and immunocompromised patients. And ethical approval was obtained from the Ethics Review Committee, Columbus South Teaching Hospital. Moving on to the results section of our study, when we consider about the basic characteristics of the study population, we have enrolled 471 patients and mean age of the study population was 59.05 years, 66.7 were female, 33.3 were males. Mean diabetic duration was 10.97 years. And when we consider about the patients who had diabetes for over 10 years, it was around 51.6%. And there were 24% for patients uh, which had documented dyslipidemia. And ischemic heart disease was documented in 11.7%. Peripheral vascular disease was in 0.8%. Stroke was documented in 1.9% patients. And uh, when we consider about the 10-year cardiovascular risk in our study population, 20.2% patients had high risk. And there were 12.7% patients who had previously documented atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And when we consider about the characteristics of statin therapy in our study population, Statin was prescribed in 93.6% patients, which was remarkable. And the statin was not prescribed only in 6.4% of patients. And when we consider about the patients who were prescribed with the statin, 13.61% was prescribed statin for secondary prevention, and 86.39% were prescribed statin for primary prevention. And when we consider about the types of statin prescribed, atovastatin was prescribed in 97.28% and rosuvastatin in 2.72% of patients. And in relation to the statin non-prescribed group, the statin prescribed group was more likely to be hypertensive and more likely to have dyslipidemia and likely to have a history of ischemic heart disease. 60 patients, 12.7% had history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and eight patients, 1.7%, had LDL level more than 190 mg per deciliter. And high risk category according to the 10 year cardiovascular risk was 20%, 2%. And all these three groups were indicated for high intensity study. Out of them, only three patients. 1.73% were prescribed with the high intensity statins. 
pressed were prescribed with the moderate intensity statin, 93.25%, and low intensity statin in four, four patients, 2.45%, two and four patients were not prescribed any statin. And when we consider about the statin, uh, intensity was the risk category. Here we see high risk category group. There are patients who were not prescribed a statin and majority were prescribed a moderate intensity statin, even with the patients who had a previous history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Majority were prescribed with a moderate intensity statin. Moving on to the achievement of the LDL therapeutic targets in this patients, LDL targets were achieved only in 10.97% patients. LDL targets were not achieved in 89.3% of patients. And we assessed the reasons for not to be on a statin. The reasons were side effects due to statin, drug interactions, non-compliance, and not prescribed. In our study population, all the patients who were not on a statin were not prescribed a statin by a uh, prescriber. There are similar studies conducted and ob observation cohort study conducted, conducted to evaluate the global pattern of comprehensive cardiovascular risk factor management with type 2 diabetes patients reported that only 48.5% of South patients were prescribed with statin. And in a multicenter study conducted in India, showed similar results, only 55.2% were prescribed with statin. But when we consider our study, it showed much higher percentage of statin prescription. And there are other reports reports showing that statins are under dose frequently in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And another study done in India showed low prescription rate of high strength statins. So our conclusions, prescription of statin among type 2 diabetes patients is satisfactory, but majority of the patients are on suboptimal doses of statin. The achievement of therapeutic targets with regard to LDSC levels is substantially low. So our recommendations, a statin prescription rates in type two diabetics is commendable, but can be improved. Patients need to be uptitrated on their statin dose to achieve cardiovascular benefits. There are several limitations in our study. This is a single set study and this was carried out during the third day of the COVID pandemic and limited patients' clinical, clinic attendance and the number of investigation done during the period of the study. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the paper is open for discussion. Please ask any questions or type in the chat box. Uh. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, Professor Amal Jaisinger. Uh, may I ask a question, a couple of questions? One is, uh, uh, how do you define uh, uh, moderate in intensity and high intensity? Which was not mentioned in your presentation. And uh, and what are, what are the guidelines are you following? Because guidelines are also changing time to time. Yes, sir. Uh, we actually followed the American Heart Association guideline, which is 2018 one. And uh, we define the high intensity and the moderate, uh, all the intensities, whether it is low, moderate to high intensity, according to the American Heart Association guideline. And uh, those intensity depends again, the doses depends again, uh, according to the stat type of statin also. We considered all of these factors to consider whether it is a moderate intensity, intensity, low intensity, or a high intensity statin, whether that the patient is on. Yeah, now what are the cutoff levels? Uh, what are the cutoff levels did uh, you have uh, used? Uh, um, Dr. Namal, uh, the statins that we used uh, was atovastatin mainly among the co authors. So, yeah. atovastatin, we considered high intensity statin as atovastatin 40 to 80, and for moderate, yeah. it was 20 to 40. 20 to 40. Yes. Okay. 
and, and with regard to the question that you asked about guidelines um the sri lankan guidelines yet to be published though it has been drafted and i'm also part of the committee so yeah. we followed the acc guideline when it comes to determining the dose of statins yeah. so according to the drafted sri lankan guideline also we are following the american one so we are saying all type 2 diabetes mellitus patients who are yeah. between 40 to 75 to have a moderate intake of statins yeah now there are two schools of thoughts now one is uh, you just go by the dose of the statin the other one is the the level of ldl cholesterol level or non ldl cholesterol level that you are going to achieve yes. so the uh, the people who are on moderate intensive statin although the doses were lower were they having a uh, ldl cholesterol level of less than 70 or close to 55 no that's the problem so most of our patients were not on ldl target i can't remember the exact value i think beyond 90% so most yeah. of them had not achieved their therapeutic target according to their risk category yeah because the guidelines say if the ldl level go go down below 40 yes. uh, to reduce the dose then uh, yes. then uh, you should not uh, take them as um, moderate intensity intensity uh, although they are at high risk uh, because there are two things one is the the dose as well as the ldl cholesterol level that you are going to achieve. as you know even with 5 mg of atorvastatin sometimes we achieve a target of uh, 55 so uh, so the, i mean uh, it, you should not go only by the guidelines you this is a clinical uh, judgment Yes, agreed, Dr. Nama. So, but yeah. the problem in our study was that most patients had not achieved the target, about ninety-three percent. Yeah, so um, that was not highlighted in the in the presentation. Okay. Uh, all what uh, 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 presented was uh, that uh, people were not on uh, the doses, uh, but there may be reasons, other reasons for not on doses because any clinician will not keep on giving high doses if the LDL cholesterol levels are less than forty. Yes. I'm yeah. trying to share that slide. I think she showed it briefly, but I think they have disabled participants screen sharing. I think. Okay. What sure. about rosuvastatin? High intensity. What is the definition there? So 10 milligrams, but most of the patients in our study was 5 milligrams. Yeah, uh, that is about half the dose of the atorvastatin. Uh, other than other issue is that that this was done in a government hospital where yeah. the the resource that in is not available. Was okay. the was the 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 treatment the did you compare the dosages of um, uh, the statin therapy with the number of physician contacts they have had? is this the just a repeat all prescriptions or is are these people being actually um, uh, seen and analyzed at a, at your clinic they were seen at the clinic but the problem was because uh, during this uh, lockdown period the number of clinic contacts they had were less so we excluded those who had two visits they were all taken only once into the study but the number of contacts as well as the number of investigations done during the last one year were comparatively less than routine clinic practice so that might also affect the ldl uh, goal achievement any other questions so um, in the absence of any questions let me thank the presenter for that excellent presentation um top nama this is the slide i'm um, sorry now we have a lovely screen share okay. this slide Yeah, thank you. Now, even there, you know, we have we won't like to see the therapeutic target that you are trying to achieve, because uh, again, various guidelines say various uh, uh, different targets. Um, so commonly, uh, we used to go uh, for seventy, but uh, as you know, we, we very high risk patients, we try to go down to fifty-five of LDA. So we would like to see how many were. At fifty-five, at least, or at least less than seventy. Okay. Oh, and also, uh, the newer target is non-HDL cholesterol uh, in the new new guideline. Uh, so that also has to be mentioned and when you write the paper. Tushar, I think these are the things yeah. that we should consider. Yes. Thank you sure very much. Thank oh, you very much. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, so let's move on to the next. No, we can't hear you now. Sorry, can you hear now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. The next presentation is a descriptive cross-sectional study of the dietary patterns, physical activity, and comorbidities of obese patients attending the medical nutrition clinic, UHKDU. The paper is by SAC Dalpadadu, UD Hiripitiya, NK Idrisingha, and R. Jayatis. The paper will be presented by UD Hiripitiya. You could start now. Please share your screen. I'm Dr. Utpala Hiripitiya. I would like to thank the 14th International Research Conference, General Sir John Kotalavala Defense University, for giving me this opportunity to present the study. This is a study of the dietary patterns, physical activity, and comorbidities of obese patients at Medical Nutrition Clinic, UHKD. Obesity is defined as an abnormal or excessive accumulation of fat, according to WHO 2021, and it is a major risk factor for non communicable diseases. And the criteria for classification of, of obesity is the BMI. A BMI of more than 30 is considered as obese, and a BMI of more than 35 is considered as morbidly obese. According to the Global Burden of Disease, which was done in 2017, it was seen that 4 million people die each year as a result of being overweight or obese. And also a study done by Adelaide Rubin in 2015, it was seen that 20% of the world's adult population will be obese in 2030. And this is due to the recent changes in people's lifestyle, demographic and economic transitions, which have caused an increase in the prevalence of obesity. A study done in Sri Lanka, Katulanda et al. 2010, the prevalence of obesity in Sri Lanka is 9.2%. And diet and physical activity levels are two main modifiable causes for obesity. An obese individual can lose up to 10% of their body weight by consuming a low-calorie diet and increasing the level of physical activity. The study will enable us to find and fill the gaps and to implement any interventions. Diet is a major causative factor for obesity. A low calorie diet of 1000 to 1200 kcal per day for women and 1200 to 1600 kcal per day for men can result in weight reduction according to Walk in 2005. The recommended number of daily servings were taken from the food based dietary guideline, and these are as follows. And uh, the serving sizes were also taken from the food based dietary guidelines. Physical activity can either be structured exercise or day to day physical activities. And according to the re recent WHO publication, it states that 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, 75 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity per week, and mod uh, moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity across the week for children and adolescents, an average of 60 minutes per day. Moderate physical activity is taken as three to six minutes, and vigorous physical activity is taken as more than six minutes. These are the recommended levels of physical activity, which is also taken from the food based dietary guideline. And these are the recommendations of duration of physical activity according to the age rules, which is also taken from the food based dietary guideline. This is a descriptive cross sectional study where all obese patients with a BMI more than 30 and registered at the Department of Medical Nutrition from November 2021 to May 2021 was taken. This was done at the Nutrition Clinic at the Department of Medical Nutrition, University Hospital, K. Obese patients with a BMI more than 30 and who were above 18 years and obese patients with or without associated comorbidities were selected for the study. Obese patients who select defaulted clinic follow-up who did not give consent and patients with renal and liver disease on their first visit, obstetric obese patients and patients below 18 years of age were excluded from the study. Data collection was done by an interviewer administered questionnaire and the data was collected on a 24-hour dietary recall and which was validated using a food frequency questionnaire and further questioning on snacking and unhealthy eating habits were done. Both clinic records and direct questioning was used. Uh, a 24-hour dietary recall intake was converted to serving sizes and calorie values. Our objective of the study was to assess the patterns of diet, level of physical activity, and comorbidities of obese patients attending medical nutrition clinic at the University Hospital KDU. 
The specific object is was to assess the dietary patterns among obese patients, to assess associated comorbidities, to assess the level of physical activity, to assess the percentage contribution of each category of food to daily dietary intake, and to assess the unhealthy dietary patterns among the study population. Analysis was done using SPSS 23 software. The results were out of the 126 patients, 50% of the obese patients were more than 45 years of age. 69% of the patients had a BMI between 30 to 35 and 31% were morbidly obese. And uh, 71 also we assessed the carbohydrate servings and it showed that 71% of the patients had 6 to 11 servings of carbohydrate during the day and 39% of the patients had three to four servings of car proteins per day. And uh, we also assessed the number of fruits taken and the amount of fruits taken. It was seen that 65% had less than two fruits per day and 41% of the patients consumed less than three tablespoons of fruits per day and 45% consumed three, tab three tablespoons of fruits per day. We also assessed the uh, variety, the number of uh, vegetables and the amount of vegetables taken during a day. It was 76% had three vegetables per day. 59% of the patients consumed more than three tablespoons of vegetables per day. It was observed that 79% had one to three snacks per day, and of that, 73.8% had unhealthy snacks such as cakes, biscuits, and chocolates. 40.5% of the patients consumed fast foods, and only 10% had it on a daily basis. 80% had them one to three days per week. 19% had a midnight snack. Skipping breakfast was seen in 23%, and 6.3% skipped meals. These are the servings from each food group consumed during a day. Sugar consumption was less than three teaspoons in majority, that is 61%. Consumption of oil was higher than the daily recommendations in more than 75%. Salt consumption was less than five grams in 84% of the population. We also assessed the physical activity on in 39.8% exercise daily. 88% of them were exercising less than one hour a day. These are the calorie contributions from the food groups during a day, carbohydrates, proteins, fruits, vegetables, snacks, sugar, and oil as follows. And the comorbidities detected in the study population, it was seen that uh, the comorbidities associated with hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia as follows. And 54% uh, of the patients did not have any associated comorbidities. The age of diagnosis of the comorbidities, in 57% more, in of the patients, it was diagnosed above age 40 years of age. And in 35% of the patients, it was diagnosed between 30 to 40 years of age. So the majority of patients were over 45 years and with a BMI of 30 to 35. 71% of the patients had 6 to 11 servings of carbohydrate during a day and majority consumed over than the recommended quantity of fruits and vegetables. Unhealthy snacking was observed in the majority and a significant proportion consumed fast foods. Skipping, skipping meals was not prevalent in the study population and midnight snacking seen only in a minority. In conclusion, it is seen that the carbohydrate consumption is comparatively high in the study population. Proteins, fruits and vegetable consumption was low and was well below the daily recommendations. And it was seen that unhealthy snacking was common and level of physical activity did not meet the WHO recommendations. Higher prevalence of comorbidities was seen in those about 40 years of age. The limitations of our study is that only the patients who were registered under the Medical Nutrition Clinic UHKD was enrolled to the study. Hence we, hence, we cannot extrapolate the results to the population. And patients with liver disease, renal disease, and obstetric and patients below 18 years of age were excluded from the study. And data was not matched with an age match population. Only suburban and urban population was included in the study. The recommendations we have are behavioral modifications in terms of diet and physical activity for clinic patients, a population-based study using a food frequency questionnaire and physical activity scale to find out the levels of physical activity and dietary habits in the population, health promotion activities to increase level of moderate to severe exercise and to reduce the level of carbohydrate and fat intake. These are our references. 
And I would like to thank KDU International Research Conference for providing the opportunity to present this study. Dr. Enuka Jayati is a consultant clinical nutritionist at Medical Research Institute Borella for supervising and guiding the research. Director University Hospital KDU for granting permission to conduct the study. The staff members of Nutrition Clinic UHKDU for their participation in the study. And most of all, all our patients of the Nutrition Clinic, UHKDU, for their participation, without which this would not have been a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. The paper is open for discussion. Can I ask what the questions regarding physical activity were, you know, did you have in your question here? How many questions and what were they? So, uh, we asked uh, the intensity of the physical activity, whether it was moderate or uh, vigorous, and uh, the duration of physical activity, sir, uh, for how long they exercised, and uh, whether they uh, how, exercised. How many questions on, day, on physical activity did, did you have in your question here? How many questions on physical activity did you have in your question here? Three, sir. So, and uh, the, the, these details you think, uh, and over what period were they supposed to comment on these details? Over one month, by recollection? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I'm uh, Dr. Amari Dalpilado. I'm one of the co-authors of this uh, paper. Uh, so in uh, food-based dietary guidelines, so they have uh, uh, categorized this into two. So we have uh, asked the recollection of physical activity over a, a period of a week. And uh, we have uh, given them the options like brisk walking, dancing, gardening, uh, etc. according to the, uh, uh, the food-based dietary guideline, uh, uh, the physical activity, uh, the scaling they have done. And from that, uh, we, have take, we have categorized them according to the uh, Myths that we have given. Thank you. Ali Alok, Alok of Athiradi, this physical activities, when was the study done? Was it the period of this COVID outbreak? Or Mics, please. There is a disturbance. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, because this was done uh, because this clinic was started during the COVID outbreak. Uh, that was one of the limitations of the study. So outdoor physical activity was definitely uh, uh, impaired in this population. Uh, so we checked the physical activity level at the booking visit, sir. Uh, and uh, however, I think that is one of the limitations because during the COVID outbreak there were uh, instances. Uh, this is after the first wave. So there were instances that they were limited uh, physical activity. So this was checked what they had on the booking visit to the clinic, sir. One, one more question. Did you all study the socioeconomic status and or the educational level uh, in these patients? Or uh, part of the study? Because uh, we did not uh, take as a part of the study, sir, but we took all the information because this is uh, taken from the database in the nutrition clinic in UHKDU, sir. Uh, so we uh, sort of uh, looked into the educational level and the socioeconomic status, but we did not uh, look into associations uh, uh, as such because we could not find a significant association. Thanks. Uh, taking from there now, if there is no significant association, that is also finding. Uh, <laughs> Professor Navali, one, one question uh, I want to ask you is, uh, now, when you measure, you were uh, talking about tablespoons. Is it is it a, a, a standard way of measuring uh, fruits and vegetables? Because what we yes, used, yeah, because what we used to do was, uh, as in dash study, uh, we are uh, um, measuring palmfuls of fruits and vegetables. Uh, so. Uh, uh, that is uh, the previous uh, uh, well-documented uh, evidence. Uh, so, so in the food-based dietary guideline, it says uh, that three tablespoons is equal to half a cup, sir. 
half a cup yeah now, uh, so that is contrary to the previously published studies uh, yes in the dash that dash is the most accepted study for the at least for cardiovascular risk prevention uh, they are the fruits and the vegetables are measured uh, as palm fulls five times five servings uh, of uh, of vegetables so uh, fruits have a benefit that is what they have said but but here you are looking mainly at the reduction of weight isn't it yes yeah Thanks. aiming for a 10 percent weight loss everything yeah. any more questions Okay, in the absence of questions, let me thank the presenter for that excellent presentation. And let's move to the next presentation. Thank you, ma'am. The next presentation is adverse events following the COVID Covishield vaccine in the first phase of the vaccine rollout in Sri Lanka. The paper is by D.S. Govindapala. WMID Nakkaveta, UTN Senaratna, W Vijay Nayaka, RMUS Senarat, TG Vijay Vardhana, P Ka Kavyangana, AD De Silva, and NS Fernando. DS Govinda Pala will be presenting the paper. Please go ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the KDYRC for this opportunity. Our study is on adverse events following CHADOX and co 19 vaccine in the first phase of vaccine rollout in Sri Lanka. As we all know, the whole world is struggling with COVID-19, which was declared as a global pandemic by the WHO on the 11th of March, 2020. It has brought the world to a standstill nearly for two years, infecting 219 million people across the world and causing 4.5 million deaths. The implemented social and public health mitigation measures were unable to curtail this pandemic so far. Hence, the development of a vaccine against severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been a main focus since the beginning of this pandemic. Before I go deep into our study, I would like to enlighten you on the history of this COVID-19 vaccination process. The first use of a vaccine against COVID-19 is reported from China with the approval of the CanSino vaccine for limited use on military personnel in June 2020. Then, in August 2020, the Russian government approved Sputnik V vaccine for emergency use. However, the official approval for a COVID vaccine was given by the WHO only in December 2020, that was for the Pfizer vaccine. In February 2021, the CHADOX NCO-19 vaccine was added to the WHO emergency use list. As of April 2021, there were 14 vaccines approved for the public use by at least one national regulatory authority in the world. The official vaccination program in Sri Lanka was commenced on the 29th of January 2021 with the CHADOX and CO-19 vaccine or the Covishield vaccine. CHADOX and CO-19 is a replication defective chimpanzee adenovirus vectored vaccine. Phase three clinical trials among several age groups have shown that this vaccine is well tolerated with lower reactogenicity profile. However, after commencing the mass distribution of Covishield vaccine, there were amid concerns about the safety. 
some of the countries in European economic areas temporarily suspended the use of Covishield vaccine over thrombotic concerns. So, we conducted this prospective observational study to provide the adverse events among the recipients of Covishield vaccine between 30th January and 5th February 2021 at the University Hospital KDU. We also aim to analyze the associations between demographic factors, comorbidities, and the occurrence of adverse events in those vaccine recipients. A cohort of 688 hospital staff were followed up till the completion of vaccination and the preliminary data are presented here. Data were collected using an interview administered questionnaire and through telephone conversations. Recipients of the vaccine were contacted 72 hours and one week after each dose to find out the details on adverse events. Only 635 participants were responded after the second dose. Based on the WHO criteria, adverse events were classified as mild, severe, or serious. If we look at the results, the age range of our population was 19 to 76 years, and 61% of our study participants were males. Five individuals had a history of COVID-19 infection at the time of the first dose and 10 individuals were infected between the first and the second doses of the vaccine. Following the first dose, 515 had experienced adverse events of which 380 reported both systemic and local adverse events, 110 had systemic symptoms and another 27 reported local adverse events. In contrast, adverse events were significantly less following the second dose, where only 131 recipients have reported adverse events, of which 11% experienced only local symptoms. Table 2.1 illustrates the incidence of adverse events following the first dose of the Covishield vaccine. Fever was the commonest systemic symptom reported by 389 participants, while vaccination site pain or tenderness was the mostly reported local symptom. This table illustrates the incidence of adverse events following the second dose. Vaccination site pain was the most frequent adverse event after the second dose. Considering the onset and the duration of the reported adverse events, most have experienced symptoms within the first 12 hours of the vaccination. Those include 77.1% after the first dose and 68% after the second dose respectively. As you can see, Symptoms have lasted less than 72 hours in the majority of the recipients after each dose. If we look at the severity of the reported adverse events, four participants have required hospital admission following the first dose of the vaccine. Two were admitted with high grade fever and body aches, and other two patients had seizures. No seizure recurrence or neurological sequelae were observed in them. None of the recipients have reported any serious adverse events following both doses of the vaccine. We analyzed data to determine any association between demographic factors, comorbidities, or a history of COVID-19 infection and the incidence of adverse events. Table 3.1 summarizes our findings. As you can see, there is a significant association between the age and the incidence of adverse events following the first dose. Also, a significant association was observed between female gender and the occurrence of adverse events 
following the second dose. Our data were compared with the findings of four other studies from four different countries, including UK, Germany, Nepal, and India. The mean ages of population in three of those studies were, com were comparable to our study. Similar to our study findings, mild post-vaccination side effects were commonly observed in all four studies. And no serious adverse events were reported apart from one incident of anaphylaxis in the Nepal study. Three studies confirmed a significant association between young age and the incidence of adverse events similar to our findings. Therefore, based on this research data, including our study, we could conclude that the Covishield vaccine is safe. However, long-term effects are yet to be assessed. Since our study consisted of a relatively young population, we recommend further studies representing all age groups to determine the incidence of adverse events in the general population. These are our references and the authors wish to acknowledge the Vice Chancellor, Dean Research and Development and the officials of General Sir John Kotalavli Defence University for the financial assistance through KDU Research Grant 2020 for this study. Thank you. Thank you very much. The paper is open for discussion. Yeah. I just want to check a clarification on the title. I, when I saw the title, it referred to Sri Lanka. Did it refer to UHKDU or to Sri Lanka? Uh, it's UHKDU, sir. Study population is representing UHKDU. In, in the title, have you mentioned that? Uh, no, title, it's... Uh, it is, uh, in Sri Lanka. That is a little misleading, yes. isn't it? Yes, sir. It's basically we studied the population is only representing the uh, recipients of the vaccine at the UHKDU, sir. If I may ask a question, how were the study subjects selected for the study? Was it a convenient sample or... Yes, you... madam. It's a, it's a convenient sample. So all the recipients who uh, uh, came to the vaccination center uh, between 30th January and 5th February. Uh, we approached them and all the consented participants were included in the study. Can I ask you a question? Yes, yes sir. How, how long did you all follow these patients up for side effects? We have said until the vaccine no longer is over. So from the day yes. of the vaccine, what was the duration of follow-up? Uh, sir, actually, this is an ongoing study. This is not only about the adverse events. Actually, we wanted to analyze their uh, uh, immune uh, antibody response as well. So we have taken blood samples prior to the first dose, after the first dose, that is just before the second dose, and uh, six weeks after the second dose. Then we are planning to take another blood sample nine months after the second dose. So we will be um, collecting data on adverse events at the nine months also. So uh, this uh, at this time, we have collected data on adverse events 72 hours and one week after each dose. And then we will be again contacting them at nine months to ask about to find out the details about long long term side effects okay really adverse effects which happen within one week of either dose yes within one week of either dose that uh, the this uh, what we presented is within one week of either dose yes <laughs> Was it only uh, staff of UHKDU that were studied? What about people who came, uh, say, the academics uh, from the public, etc.? Were they also included in your study, only staff members? No, madam. This is from 30th January to 5th February. So during that period, only the UHKDU staff were. So only the UHKDU staff was included during this period because uh, for the convenience of follow-up. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you. But even, even not all UHKDU staff. I was in that sample. I don't think I was approached. 
so you i think all this recipients who came to the vaccination center uh, we have invited and consented participants were included in the study sir during that period from 30th to 5th february uh dr dumita now uh, when you recollect uh, some uh, in this data in nine months are you planning to see whether how many people have got uh, the infection and the severity uh, of the people who have vaccinated yes so in nine months when we are collecting blood samples for the uh, antibody we will be uh, contacting them to see whether they have got any long term adverse events as well as whether they have got the covid-19 infection after the vaccine and if they have got the infection as you said the severity the disease will be also evaluated okay and you can correlate that with the antibody levels as well and, yeah. okay yeah, that would be very interesting thank you thank you i'm professor fernando pulle can i ask a question yes madam uh dumita how now you said there were two cases who got fits did you all do yes. a causality assessment on that or it's just uh, saying that they got a fit or but no madam we we, we, we we evaluated them uh, including uh, all the neurological investigations including a uh, mri brain and then uh, because the none of those people have previous uh, seizures or any previous comorbidities so we have reported these cases to the moh as well okay no because you said they were not classified according to the who classification of serious they would have fitted into serious isn't it i know madam in the who classification it's not come under serious it comes under severe adverse events serious is life threatening or disabling uh, adverse events according to the who criteria okay so the fits they categorized under severe okay okay thank you thank you madam any further questions So um in the absence of any further questions let me thank Dr Govinda Pala for that excellent presentation and we are looking forward to um, uh, the further findings from your study thank you Dumita thank you madam thank you so let's move on to the uh, next presentation which is impact of parenting parenting style on borderline personality disorder in um in young uh, I'm sorry. The paper is the impact of parenting style on borderline personality disorder in young females in Sri Lanka. A review of cases. This paper is presented and authored by K. Hetty Goda. Please start your presentation. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Kanthi Hetty Goda, attached to University Hospital, KDU. Today, I'm going to talk about impact of parenting style on borderline personality disorder in young females in Sri Lanka. Here, I'm going to review four cases I treated at my private sector as a last University Hospital, KDU. As we all know, borderline personality is the biggest. burden on mental health uh, professionals because they don't respond to medicine and they don't respond to most of the psychotherapy interventions available uh, for many other disorders borderline personality disorder is defined as a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of high idealization and devaluation marked by a persistently unstable self image or sense of self the prevalence of ppd is estimated to be 1.5 in the general population and 20% among in patient this is cross culturally look like the same but we don't have sri lankan prevalence rate 
for now. And BPD predominantly diagnosed in female look like 75% are borderline, 75% uh, borderline patients are female. And BPD commonly co occurs with mood disorders, substance misuse, eating disorders, post traumatic stress disorder, and other personality disorders. Biosocial model of uh, BPD suggests emotional vulnerability and invalidity of emotions caused by parental hostility and resentment, especially when they are young, exposure to domestic violence, observing them and parental conflicts, childhood neglect and abuse can predispose BPD. While one parent be hostile to the child, in most of the cases, not both parents are hostile, just only one parent, but rarely we can see both parents are equally hostile. The other parent who is tolerating it will be perceived by the child as an enabler and develop resentment towards that parent as well. So this lead to a reciprocal hostility towards each other, parent and the child. Because of that, I aim to do in this study to explore the role of mother's hostility or hostile parent style and father's enabler nature in developing and maintaining BPD in young girls in Sri Lanka. The method I adopt adopted here is retrospective explanations recorded in uh, practitioner clinical notes of four clinically diagnosed female BPD clients. Even though it is not necessary to obtain informed consent for review articles because I did not intend to publish the data by the time I collected these, I usually obtain verbal consent from the clients to keep written record and use them for learning and research purposes before starting therapy sessions. After reviewing these four cases, I could conclude the following findings. And I could see a lot of commonalities, similarities among these four girls. They were between 17 to 30 years, unmarried female, and they were about oh, uh, average IQ, presented with self-harm, mainly cutting. We could clearly see cutting on their hands, forearms, and uh, sometimes on the thighs and breast. And they had unreasonably low self-esteem, no matter how intelligent they are, and how beautiful they are, how talented they are, they have very low self-esteem and self-criticism and blame towards themselves, saying I'm a fa failure, uh, so I am not good at anything, I'm not worthwhile. And they have a lot of relationship issues. Sometimes they change their partners very frequently. They go into very deep relationship very quickly, within few weeks, maybe few days, and they break up and they have a lot of reactions toward this breakup. They cry for days and days, and they, uh, after a few weeks, they go into another relationship, and this this goes on and on. They have very poor emotional regulation. They get angry. They manipulate other people. They uh, most of the time uh, threat others that are going to commit suicide, and they have significant trust issues not only for the partners, they have trust issues even with the therapist. So this is very challenging for the therapist to continue therapy with this kind of patients. And these girls said they have observed or they have witnessed their mothers being very cruel to them, including hostility, harsh punishments, criticism, especially about their appearance, their chubbiness, uh, their school performance, they had a lot of conditional love. If you can perform this way, I love you. Otherwise, I don't. They evaluate, evaluate the emotions of the child and also fathers being very enabling this hostility. They didn't take any action against these mothers or they couldn't take any actions. 
I interviewed one of those fathers and he said, no, I don't, I didn't want to go into trouble or I didn't want to uh, increase the conflict between me and my wife. So I just kept quiet. So the child perceived his father as an enabler of uh, hostility. And most of these cases had been precipitated and perpetuated by low self-esteem, uh, maybe breaking up with the relationship or breaking trust by someone. So they start showing these personality traits, especially after the age of 16. Rarely we see these uh, symptoms even before 16, but usually we diagnose personality disorder after 16. And I could see reciprocal nature of parent-child relationship even in these four cases. And all of them accuse their pay fathers for enabling and tolerating their mother's cruelty. And they strongly say that they won't raise children though they get married in future one day. They also scored high in schemas such as abandonment, uh, emotional deprivation and abuse, mistrust and failure in young schemas uh, questionnaire. With this observation, I could conclude that parental hostility has a direct influence on developing and maintaining of CPD and which is concurrent with most of the other studies in the other parts of the world. And non-hostile parents tend to be perceived as an enabler and there is a reciprocal effects of parenting and borderline personality disorder. Uh, this also has been proven in other parts of the world. As parents are not aware of the consequences of this behavior, parents continue to practice their maladaptive and harsh parenting style which can lead to worse outcome of the BPD. So this was ob obvious. So child look at parents as very hostile and parents look at the child as a very uh, disobedient uh, or very uh, problematic child, especially as they start relationship very young and they go into sexual relationship when they are very young. So they have a lot of accusers against, accusations against this child. With these observations and conclusions, I would like to recommend for the other practitioners to pay attention to the, uh, to either to the retrospective or prospective information of their clients in order to understand this complicated disorder. This is a very complicated disorder and identify best intervention after do a good formulation. And we need to identify the reciprocal effect of parenting and uh, BPD symptoms. And we need to use this knowledge in the therapy and we need to provide psychoeducation time to time. We need to conduct conversations whenever and wherever appropriate. And uh, we could adopt dialectical behavior therapy uh, as this is one of the best evidence-based therapeutic intervention for BPD, we can use both individual and group sessions. And we need to teach distress tolerance skills, emotional regulation, relationship management, and mindfulness skills, which found to be very effective with BPD clients. I found these are these as very effective methods to reduce their self-harm and to have good relationship with their partners and parents and friends and they could pay attention to whatever they are doing. However, as this is a prospective study, this is concomitant with methodological issues such as tendency of patients with BPD to misinterpret or misreport past experiences with family members because sometimes when we cross check what the children report, some of those things had never happened. The child may uh, magnify or exaggerate what happened. And I observe most of the girls, they have a lot of frustrations, but they could blame on the parents because that is the easiest way. As we all know, uh, it is the parents we select to uh, spill over all our frustrations and anger. But whenever possible, we can use prospective records whenever possible to minimize these 
methodological flaws. Thank you very much. I would like to answer any of the questions. Thank you for that very interesting paper. The paper is open for discussion. May I ask a question? Now, you, your case studies were only females. Didn't you find any males who had this borderline personality disorder or is it that very uncommon among males? I think she didn't hear. We can't hear what Kanti is saying. Kanti, can you hear us? Kanti, I don't know whether you heard the question. Uh, my observation yes, I heard was that, that. Can you yes. hear me now? Uh, we, yeah. can. we can. I heard the question uh, clearly. So actually, uh, borderline personality disorder is very uncommon in males. And during my research period, uh, this uh, 2020 and 21 April, I didn't meet, uh, meet any of the male uh, patients with BPD all were female so that's why and it says only 25% male but I have seen them in other uh, like uh, times but not during this time period. Is Can't there an associate? Sorry sir, yes. go ahead. Can't it, now all four patients presented with deliberate self-harm. Yes uh, sir. Uh, can deliberate self-harm in this age category be a part of some kind of manipulative behavior for advantage? Yes, a uh, lot of girls who are not borderline also using that. It's like a trend and a wave. Sometimes people observe this on social media and they also follow to their parents and their partners and all. But these particular, these four cases actually, they uh, meet the full uh, criteria for BPD as well. So, yes. Uh, self-harm is not only in BPD, they use it as a manipulative behavior, especially to threat parents and partners. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there a connection between BPD and, um, uh, say, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder? Are there sort of, is, is that, so in BPD, you said there is, there is, Sorry, yeah. Uh, is there any other association between different um, psychiatric disorders and BPD? Yes, it's a, it's a comorbidity. It's very high with uh, depression, and uh, it could be uh, OCD. And uh, most of them have uh, of them have actually morbid jealousy when they uh, find a partner when they get married. Morbid jealousy is very connected with BPD because they always have trust issues based on the trust issue. Sometimes it's acquired morbid jealousy, but sometimes it's just the morbid jealousy because of their trust issues while the partners are very uh, honest and uh, fidelity is there, but still they perceive as the partners in fidelity and uh, they see that they are engaged in other activities and other women and they check uh, their behaviors and they check their phones very frequently and uh, argue and make quarrels and fight with and sometimes they, they bruise their husbands and they fight, they hit them. Uh, there are a lot of chaos at home uh, with the uh, BPD partner and the other partner. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. In the absence of any further questions, thank you very much for that interesting presentation, Kanti. Let's move on to the last presentation of this session. It is um, psychometric properties of single aversion of burden of scale for family caregivers, short form. It's a validation study in Sri Lanka. The paper is by N. Ratnayaka, T. Abegunasekara, W. D. Soisa, D. Palangahat Singham, and S. Le Kambasam. The paper will be presented by N. Ratnayaka. Please go ahead.
A very good day to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Our study title is The Psychometric Properties of Singular Version of Burden Scale for Family Caregivers Short Form, a Validation Study in Sri Lanka. Who is a family caregiver? Family caregiver or an informal caregiver is a person who provides care to family or friends usually without a payment. A caregiver provides care generally in the home environment for an aging parent, spouse, other relative or unrelated person or an ill or a disabled person. The caregivers experienced burden because of the caregiving, which mainly affect on their quality of life, ability to work, mental and the physical health status. This subjective caregiver burden is defined as the person's subjective self-evaluation of feeling burden. This caregiver burden is mainly linked with the various negative outcomes such as health, mortality risk, institutionalization, and the caregiving style. The assessment of caregiver burden has become an important component in the current healthcare system. There are several tools to be used to evaluate the caregiver burden of the informal or family caregiver. The most commonly used tool in the literature for this assessment of family caregiver burden is the short form of burden scale for family caregivers, which includes 10 items under the aspects of social, psychological, financial, and the physical. Currently, the rate of the aging of the population around the world is increasing dramatically, particularly in low and middle income countries, including Sri Lanka. These all the people are more prone to get an impairment of physical, psychological and social functions and therefore these people are more likely to be frail and dependent. These all the people are cared by family or informal caregivers most of the times in Sri Lanka, mainly focusing on their proper nutrition, safety and security, psychosocial needs and activities and exercises. The literature says the caregivers of all the people report higher burden when compared to the caregivers of other people. The changing family structure and cultural and religious beliefs in the society in Sri Lanka may create additional burden to the family caregivers of all the people. The assessment of caregiver burden to take steps to enhance the quality of life of caregivers of all the people and care receivers is vital therefore. And however, a lack of culturally adapted tool may limit this task in the context of Sri Lanka. Therefore, in this study, we aimed for the cross-cultural adaptation and evaluation of psychometric properties of singular version of burden scale for family caregivers short version. We carried out a validation study in the teaching hospital Karapitya after obtaining the ethical clearance from Ethics Review Committee, Faculty of Medicine, University of Pune. The validation process comprised of two processes, cross-cultural adaptation and the psychometric properties evaluation. The cross-cultural adaptation was done according to a standard protocol described by Beaton et al., which includes proper translation, synthesize a common version with the translation, backward translation, relieving by expert group to ensure the content validity and have focus group discussions and the pre-testing to ensure the phase validity. This is the singular version of burden scale for family caregiver short version which we finalized in this process and this tool has shown that it take maximum of 55 minutes for the completion. Then this singular version of burden scale for family caregivers singular version was administered among consented family caregivers of randomly selected all the patients who were the regular attendees of medical and the neurology clinics of teaching hospital Karapitiya. So we administered this questionnaire among 81 consented family caregivers. The patients who were cared by these caregivers had moderate to totally dependent physical activities which is measured using the Barthel index. 
Along with the Sinhala version of Burden Scale for Family Caregiver short version, we administered the Sinhala version of short form 36 survey as well. After two weeks of the first administration, we contacted 24 family caregivers and administered the Sinhala version of Burden Scale for Family Caregiver short version again via a telephone conversation. Then the psychometric properties were analyzed mainly test rate as reliability, internal consistency, construct validity, concurrent validity, flow and sailing effects. Let's move to the results. The median age of the participants were say 47 years and majority of them were females, had monthly income less than 20,000 Sri Lankan rupees, educated up to GCE or level and were married. Nearly half of them were unemployed and the person who received the care for most of them were their parent or spouse. And also most of the care receivers were staying with them at the same living place. You can see the most of the caregivers in this study had experienced moderate level of caregiver burden while most of them had moderate level of quality of life as well. So when we concerning the psychometric properties of this scale, the reliability evaluated with the internal consistency measured with combat alpha was very high and also the item total correlation was ranged from 0.38 to 0.81. And further, the test reader's reliability evaluated with the consecutive evaluation of the questionnaire measured with intra-class correlation was also very high, which indicated high reliability in this questionnaire. The construct validity evaluated with the fact, fact analysis based on the principal component analysis. We observed the sample size was adequate for this, to do this construct validity analysis and also there were no multiple linearity observed between these items in the questionnaire. Therefore, we observed three factor structure in this single version of burden scale a question in a short version, icon value exceeding one, explaining the 75.28% of cumulative variance with high factor loadings in each item. This is how each item was consolidated in each factor. Item number one, two, nine, and consolidated, uh, 10 consolidated in the factor one, and item three, four, five consolidated in the factor three, while item six, seven, eight consolidated in the factor two. Then the concurrent validity was evaluated by observing the correlation between the scores of burden scale and the SF36 survey. Then we observed strong negative correlation between these two scores, which indicated higher burden may influence on the low quality of life. Not only that, we observed that there are strong significant correlation between the domain scores of the short form 36 survey and the burden scale scores. Further, only three subjects presented with lower score, while none presented with the maximal score. Therefore, no flow, neither ceiling effect was found in this questionnaire. The process of the cross-cultural adaptation was done according to a standard protocol, assuring the content validity with the original version, mainly concerning the appropriateness, cultural relevance, conceptual meaning of each item of the questionnaire. The observed psychometric properties were almost similar with the existing studies, except the factor structure. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that the single version of burden scale for family caregiver short version adopted cross-culturally shows satisfactory reliability and validity. This can be used to assess the subjective burden of family caregivers of all the people in Sri Lanka. Since it is a feasible and economical measure to estimate the caregiver's subjective total burden, this can be applied in the context of enhancing the quality of life of both for informal family caregivers and care receivers. And also this may provide more avenues for the future research as well. 
the applicability of this burden scale for short uh, family caregiver short duration should be extended to other situations like caregivers of persons with dementia and children with disabilities as well. These are the references we have used in this presentation. And finally, I would like to acknowledge all the participants of the study and the consultants of the clinics who allowed us for the data collection. And thank you very much for your Thank you very much. I think that was a very timely um, uh, study which, which uh, uh, where you have tried to validate this particular questionnaire because um, we all know that uh, elderly population is increasing and we are going to have issues with uh, elder looking after these elderly people. Uh, the paper is open for discussion. Uh, can you tell the characteristics of your experts and also the the focus group discussion participants also I didn't quite catch who they were. Uh, actually, sir, the uh, expert group comprised of uh, two physicians. Oh, not not clear. Your answer is not clear. Pediatrician. And also, there were two nursing academics included in that expert group. As sir, now can can you hear me, sir? Uh, now it's I much can better. Hear. Yeah. Can you repeat okay. what you said about experts? Uh, the expert group of our study comprised of a of a geriatrician as well as two uh, physicians and also two nursing academics. Not only uh, those five people, we uh, we get the cooperation of these forward translation translators and the backward translators as well. The forward translators include a nursing nurse and also a, a medical officer. The back for the backward translation also uh, the similar uh, category we have used and uh, regarding the focus group discussion uh, so we went to the uh, professorial medical unit of the teaching hospital Karapitiya and then uh, we uh, obtained uh, about uh, six, uh, six to eight participants, uh, six to eight uh, caregivers who were cared, who cared the, uh, the patients uh, at the uh, professorial clinics uh, so then uh, we discuss uh, with those uh, uh, caregivers uh, regarding the each and every item of this questionnaire. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Are you planning any further studies to use this validated questionnaire on a bigger population? Uh, yes, madam. Actually, uh, this is also a part of uh, one study. Uh, so we we were planned to uh, collect data uh, uh, nearly about 170 caregivers, but due to this COVID pandemic, we were able to conduct only uh, reach only 81 family caregivers. Uh, but we are going to apply this one uh, with another study, uh, uh, which may uh, have uh, the family caregivers of uh, patients with hip fracture, madam. Vimala, can I ask you a question? Is family caregivers yes. have evaluated only the people who are giving care at home, isn't it? In your study, you have the validation process, you all included only people giving care at home, am I correct? Uh, no, sir. Uh, so, in the basic uh, characteristic questionnaire, we just ask where uh, the what is the uh, living place of the caregiver. So, most of the patients, uh, most of the caregivers, uh, cared uh, the uh, all the patients at their home. But there were some uh, uh, caregivers who provided the care. Uh, for the uh, uh, for the older people who are not at the same living place, uh, so they they may live in some separate places as well. Yeah, okay, can this study be uh, used in the hospital setting as well? Because there are so many caregivers who uh, stay in the hospital. Can this same study be, uh, or same tool be used for that purpose versus the burden of caregivers in hospitals? 
so I think uh, we can use this tool because when we are doing the focus group discussion also, uh, those uh, the caregivers who involved with the focus group discussions as well as the pre-testing also, they had a, a kind of moderate level of burdens. Uh, so I think this tool can be used for the uh, the caregivers who are in the uh, clinical setting as well, not only with the home setting. But if you can do that, COVID is yes. an ideal scenario for using it because there are so many caregivers in hospitals, particularly yes. in COVID wards, who are stuck for 10 to 14 days without being able to go home. And they can't even uh, go home for a short period but once they are okay. they're committed to being there. So I think their burden or stress level must be fairly significant when you compare it with, with another any other situation. So if you can use it, yes. that would be very good to a good tool to use to find out how it has impacted on the people who have not got COVID but who are I mean, compelled to be with their relatives during this period. It's coming. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for actually we have to thank you, sir, for exploring, exploring that new avenue for the research. So thank you very much. Any further questions? Okay, in the absence of any further questions, thank you, Nirmala. That was a very, very uh, interesting and excellent presentation. And thank I you, think a very useful tool which can be used in a wide variety of settings uh, as suggested by Professor Patirana, uh, we can be used anywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. So that brings us to the close of this session. Let me just summarize. We had a wide variety of presentations starting from lab-based um, uh, studies going on to uh, psychiatry, to um, to uh, elderly care and to um, obesity. So we spanned a, a, a quite a variety of subjects and uh, I must thank the presenters for their clear presentations as well as the excellent uh, audio visuals. Um, and also mostly for to keeping to time and um, answering the questions that have been asked. So thank you very much. You all did very well and those were all excellent presentations. Let me thank the, my co-chair, Dr. Nishant Kumara Singh. He was chairing another session, so he was unable to join most of the time. The judges, Professor Aloka Patirana and Professor Namal Vijay Singh for their um, uh, 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 functioning as uh, referees and judges for this session. So, and uh, thank you for all the participants who participated actively and uh, contributed to uh, having a a, a very constructive discussion and let's hope that we will see more of this kind of presentations at a future IRC. So thank you very much and I'm concluding this session from this end. Thank you and let's see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the first technical session, which was interesting and attractive. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank Professor Ishani Rodrigo and Dr. Nishanta Kumara Singha for chairing this session. And the two eminent judges, Professor Aloka Patirana and Professor Nama Vijay Singha for kindly accepting our invitation to judge this session. With this, we conclude the first session of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalavala Defense University. The next session will start at 10.45 a.m.